One morning, I'm going to go sell drugs as usual. I got a driver, I'm in the car, and uh, you know, I remember kicking back like this, and I'm just kind of looking up, and I hear this voice, everything kind of muffles out, and, it, and he says, why are you killing, stealing, and destroying the very lives I'm giving people? I'm going to my cell, because I'm facing the 25 years. The interesting part is that I meet a guy there, and he tells me he's a pastor. I go to my cell, I look up the next day, and he's uh, in his cell, and he's prostrated on the ground, kind of like, you know, with his blanket. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna ask this guy some questions. But he don't get up. So I go work out, he didn't get up. I go eat, he didn't get up. You know, we're talking an hour later, man. And I'm like, what the heck? So I'm eating a soup, and he gets up. And so I yell at him, yo! And so I go, hey, meet me at the gate. So I go meet him at the gate. I go, man, what were you doing? He's like, I was praying for you. He goes, I'm only here for you. Well, it's an honor to be here in, we're in Houston, Houston, Texas. Uh, Pastor Juan, for people who don't know you, who maybe have never seen you, could you just introduce yourself for those who are watching on the other side of the screen? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Juan Martinez. I'm married to a beautiful uh, woman uh, named, I call her my baby Ruth, even though her name's Ruthie. You know, I call her my baby Ruth because I love chocolate and uh, I knew God loved me when he gave me my baby Ruth. We have uh, six children, and we have a dog named Max. We're kind of like the Hispanic Brady Bunch, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's who we are. I pastor a church in Houston called uh, Get Rap Church. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor, for opening up your doors to us and allowing us to uh, be able to not only record your testimony, but record a couple of other testimonies. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, tell us about your testimony of Jesus, starting with your childhood. Okay, so, um, you know, I was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, raised in Hoboken, and I, say, I like to say Manhattan, New York, because I was like, uh, where we lived was 12th and Hudson, and so when we would walk outside, I would see the whole New York City skyline. So uh, at a young age, we kind of all went to New York, and, uh, you know, Puerto Rican. I say that because, you know, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans in New York and New Jersey and uh, everything growing up, everything for us was like a party, you know, they call it parrandas. And so uh, we were always in parties, you know, as a, as a young kid, I remember just going house to house and partying on the holidays. And if you know my culture, you know, they're always eating, always drinking, and we will find anything to kind of have a party. And so that's kind of how... Uh, most of my childhood was, you know, thinking back about those times. But when I was uh, about eight years old, my parents, they got into an argument. You know, my dad is a classic Hispanic man. You know, he kind of went out on the weekends. Um, mom and I would go to Catholic mass. I didn't really know God then. I just thought God was real far away, you know, and uh, hopefully he could hear me. What ends up happening is that I remember sometimes she would say, go get your dad. And so my dad never really went to church. So, you know, you look up to your dad and he doesn't go to church. You don't think it's just as important. So you kind of get upset that you got to go to church. Mm. But I would, you know, enjoy it and stuff, you know, even though knowing what I know now back then, I, I was just kind of going through the motions of things. You know, we would go and then behave however we wanted to. Uh, at about eight years old, you know, I'm playing baseball. Little League, and so I have this Little League bat, you know, I have this glove. My dad, you know, it was hard getting him to go and participate kind of like in those kind of things. So he never really, to this day, you know, he'd never seen me play baseball. Mm. And so uh, one day they're arguing, I think I'm about eight, seven years old or eight, and uh, they're arguing and, you know, they have a bedroom and right next to that bedroom is my room. And then there's like the living room and the kitchen. So it was a small apartment. And what winds up happening is that they just start, it, it escalates. And I could hear all the yelling and stuff. And then before you know it, I turn to the side. He has, it's the first time I ever see this, right? So he has my mom by her hair and um, he's just yelling at her, you know? And um, I remember feeling so helpless. Like, I remember, you know, thinking about that day, I remember feeling like, like I, I, I needed to save my mom, but that was my dad. And I was so confused on why that was happening. But I remember my first instinct was like, grab the bat. So, you know, I grabbed my Little League bat. I run into that room and I uh, home run swing at my dad's knee. And so, you know, he, he lets go of my mom and uh, he uh, falls to the ground. Obviously, he pushes me. And uh, what winds up happening is that day my mom grabbed me by the hand. We walked to the door. 
she looked down at me and she said, uh, you know, my name is Juan, but they call me Johnny. So she goes, Johnny, you never let someone hit you. Never in your whole life. And so I was like, yes, mom. So we walk out. Funny to say that my aunt lived next door. So we actually walked out and just went around and went into that apartment. And uh, that was the moment when my mom and dad kind of got divorced. After that, what winds up happening is that, you know, we keep living life and trying. To, my mom trying to do the best that she can, um, raising me. I uh, had a cousin there named Marilyn, you know, we're, we're hanging out. She becomes like my sister, brother named Jimmy. And this is the disco era. So I was, uh, you know, I was uh, raised in the clubs and all that, like Studio 54, Roxanne, you know, uh, Palladium, you know, Roxy's. I say Roxanne, Roxy's. All these clubs and uh, all the disco. And so my cousin Marilyn's trying to teach me how to do disco. And, you know, she, I'm going to be her dancing partner everywhere we went. And so I, I really enjoyed that. You know, I knew it had the partying background. I had all the stuff. And, you know, uh, she's the one that's like my first cigarette. You know, she's like, you ever tried this? And so I remember coughing and hacking up a lung, but you know, I guess back then I wasn't a quitter either. So I attempted to become a smoker and obviously everything on television and everybody on the streets. That moment, you know, I remember moving to 12th and Hudson. I think I told my mom, you know, stepdad came into my life and I just re wanted to rebel, you know, she, she was trying to do the best she can. So she was like really overprotective. You know, it was always kind of dark in the house and, you know, she didn't want me to go outside and stuff. And so what winded up happening is that she would let me go to the front. And so I had all my friends, you know, we call it the block and uh, they were all hanging out out there. My mom would look out the window and she'd say, Johnny, sube para arriba. You know, that meant come upstairs. And so all my friends started calling me, oh, your mama's boy. And so that's the name calling. And then I was probably the lightest guy there with blue eyes. So, you know, they, I didn't look like all the other Puerto Ricans. So now I have, you know, I guess I don't even know who I am. You know, I'm trying to be as Puerto Rican as I can. And uh, if you know my culture, that's important. You know, they'll rock the socks, the T-shirt and everything. And so... I think it took one day, there was one day where I was outside and they were like, mama's boy. And I was like, my mom was yelling out the window. And I was like, that's where it all began. I was like, you ain't going to do that. So I, I, I rebelled and I bucked. And so I winded up going around the corner. I'll never forget. I went around the corner and that's where I got introduced to marijuana in a basement. And so I'm probably like 13. And so I start smoking pot and I don't know, it made me funnier. It made me, uh, you know, it made me bold. It made me feel like I was somebody, you know? I was always like, I don't know, I was always a jokester. So I think everybody else liked me smoking pot too. So at that point, you know, I got a couple guys and that, you know, I'm selling, I started selling drugs because I don't know, it just seemed like the cool thing to do. All the movies were telling me to sell drugs. All the music was telling me to sell drugs. And obviously I didn't have uh, a dad to follow in the footsteps. You know, I just thought, at that moment, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be um, somebody because I felt like I wasn't nobody, I guess, you know? I didn't really have people at my games, you know, except for my mom. And then my stepdad, you know, he comes in the picture and he he's, he's pretty cool. I'm just rebelling against him because I'm like, you're not my dad. So I ain't letting no male role model do that. And my mom, she's upset because I'm getting home and they, you know, she's like, you've been drinking, you know, all this stuff. But I, at that point, I'm like, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to like, you're going to walk with me to school? Like, you got to go to work. So I know that sounds horrific, and it probably was. You know, I, I, I always loved my mom. You know, she was very dear to my heart because, you know, she, she tried so hard. And um, you, we just had like a, a rut. There was like six years where we would get robbed everywhere we went. So we always had nothing. By the time I'm 13 and I'm smoking and all that, um, at 14, one of my friends is selling cocaine. So he's like, you ain't, you ain't making the money you should make. So I, at 14 years old, I make a decision to start selling cocaine. And my mom and my stepdad, they get in a venture. Even though my mom doesn't drink, doesn't do anything, but my stepdad did. And so he convinces her to open up a bar. And so he opens up a bar and then they open up two bars. And so now I'm the 14 year old kid that's parents has bars and every, all my friends want to hang out. So we're at the bars and I become the 14 year old that's distributing cocaine to the adults. So I'm hanging out with all the 40 years old, 50 year olds, you know, uh, later I find out, you know, everybody behind the scenes is doing the same thing. You know, I have a, a cousin back then that, uh, you know, my mom to this day is like, you know, but uh, he winds up 
taking me under his wing and we you know you might call it discipleship it was just in the in the opposite and so he's teaching me his ways he's teaching me all this stuff i think by the time i'm 15 i'm i'm selling to not just my whole high school but i'm also selling uh to the high schools around so at lunch break when most people most kids are going to eat their lunch i was going to other high schools and selling drugs you know, I winded up obtaining some stepbrothers that were doing the same thing. And so, you know, some of my goals were, I wouldn't go to, I would cut class as I kept, you know, I think on my senior year, if I didn't um, have 900 to $1,000 in my pocket for lunch, I wouldn't go to school. It was this weird thing uh, that I had. And so I would always try to keep uh, lunch money. You know, I became the guy that bought everything for everybody. And as that keeps going, you know, it went from, smoking, selling cocaine to using it a lot. And, um, but for me, I never thought I had a problem. I, I always thought it was a party. And then what winds up happening is that in high school, I think my, by my senior year, the detectives would be waiting for me outside and I, I'm out of control. I think they, they found stuff in my locker. You know, the, the detectives are constantly getting me in the car. So I'm already in this life leading me to nowhere. You know, it's just destroying my life. I remember they gave me a opportunity. They were like, look, you, you're gonna graduate, but you gotta go get help. And so I remember going in December uh, to this place. It was, it was somewhere, it was about 11 hours from where we lived. And I remember it being right before Christmas. And so, you know, you watch enough movies. And, and again, I had this, I had to be, I guess because I was skinny, you know, all that. So I had to be the loudest guy in the room, the guy with the most money, the flashiest guy. You know, I had to be all that because I didn't really know who I was and I didn't have anybody really telling me who I was. So I, I just watched stuff. So when I'm over there and they're like, you can't go home and I'm thinking it's the holidays. I remember pulling out, I remember talking to this guy and setting up a fight. You know, I go, hey, you know, you don't want to be here, you know? And so he's like, I don't, what are we going to do? And so I go, we're going to, we're going to stage a fight. And so we're going to stage this fight so we could go home and we could party. And so, you know, we stage the fight, but the guy puts me in a headlock and he starts kind of punching me in the head pretty hard. And so I grabbed this, I had bought this little can of Welch's grape and I started hitting this guy. And, uh, I think that was the first time I like, got like so angry that I just I just lost it and I beat this guy so bad with this you know those little cans don't bend easy well this one bent and cr literally crushed in my hand and so beat him so badly they broke us apart they kicked me out um I got back home as planned you know I was like mom, mom you know so I winded up partying and uh when I got back to school in January they made me go again so they had me go to this same place and they're like if you don't if you don't finish this you will um you won't graduate this is where I started learning, I think, how to manipulate and go through the motions, right? Because at this moment, I had, they're telling me, I love my mom. I'm doing everything in my own strength because I, I don't have God in my life. And so all I know is like Scarface, Biggie Smalls, Tupac, Jay-Z, and all those guys, when I was growing up, they're selling CDs, you know, out the trunk, you know? So we, we're very familiar with all those guys before they even got famous, you know? Some of my, you know, cousins are like, laundry mats and all the stuff, you know, that were like decoys. And so that's everything I'm growing up in. So I, I maneuver and I wind up finishing the, the, the place. I, I swear I learned how to get through something. All my teachers passed me. And what happens is that, you know, I wind up saying, you know, I, I need, I want to change, man. I don't, but I don't know how to do it. And so I think that change is going to come about because one of my friends joined the military. And so I joined the military. And so I'm a veteran today. I joined the USS Navy. Now you would think that getting away, everything would change. My mom was super happy. Right before that happens, I wind up getting someone pregnant. So I'm the guy that has a girl pregnant in high school. Um, I don't have a dad to um, uh, walk with me. I mean, my mom's like, she's giving me, you know, don't do it, you know, get married, don't do this, just because you're having a baby. And the other side, you know, they're Seventh-day Adventists and they're like, you know, you you got to get married, you got to pregnant. And so I'm, I think, you know, my mom always try to do right by me. And so I, I think I'm doing right. So I'm going to join the military and I'm going to get married. And so I wind up getting married. I think I was like 18 or something. I get married, you know, now I have a child and I'm in the Navy. And so rather than changing, it's wild, but like four of my friends wind up joining the Navy and they're all from the same neighborhood. And so we winded up uh, selling drugs, but now I had a uniform to hide under. 
So when cops would stop me, or I would literally stand on the block, everybody got fitted on with Timberlands, and I'm actually out there with a Navy uniform. And so the cops would never say nothing to me. They'd be like, you, get out of here. And so everybody else would uh, be in cuffs, and I'm just kind of walking home, nervous, you know? And I used that kind of as, as a facade, and uh, military taught me a lot of things, you know, obviously. National Defense Medal, all the stuff, Desert Storm. So it taught me a lot of things. It taught me how to grow up in some fashion, but again, uh, I still had a void in my heart. I remember getting out, you know, now I'm hitting the clubs, I'm transporting drugs. I met people in Virginia, so now I'm transporting drugs to Virginia. That's how that goes. I remember telling my dad one time, you know, you, why do you always get jobs for people? I'm in my 20s. At, at this point, I'm in after hours. Again, I'm at every club selling drugs, Studio 54, everything. So now I'm not just dancing. Now my personality is larger than life. In bigger amounts, you know, you keep graduating from that stuff. You know, you, it's your goal. You know, you want to graduate. And so uh, what winds up happening is I tell my dad, you know, you always get jobs for people. You get jobs. They come from Puerto Rico. You get jobs. And I think it was maybe a desperate cry, and I didn't know how to say I need out. I say, uh, you know, you always get jobs and you always help them. You get a place. And he said, he actually lived. At this point, I'm selling crack on the third floor. I'm basically a pimp. I got prostitutes coming in and out. I wasn't actually standing on the corner anymore. I'm, I'm just, my life's a wreck. And downstairs is my mother's bar. But they gave me an apartment on the third floor to try to help me. And all I did was kind of do what I did best, and that was get high, you know, and now I'm like in the pimping arena, so I'm doing all that, and so. And this is at 20 years old? This is in my early 20s. Wow. Early 20s, yeah, my early 20s, when I got out of the military. Wow, how, uh, how long were you in the military, two I years? I was in the military, about three years, three years and some change, so yeah, I got an honorable discharge from that. Don't know how that happened, but it happened, grace. Mm. And so I uh, talked to my dad, and he lived on the other corner, so it's wild, so we didn't have a relationship, we lived on the corner, he said, Johnny said, I, I know I know how you are. I know what you're doing. I see you out there. Because, you know, he's doing his kind of partying, which was drinking the bar. And so he's like, I see you. And so at this point, you know, he said, you know what? If you straighten up, I'll help you. And I'll never forget this. I remember getting so excited. There's not a lot of things you remember. You remember pivotal moments in your life when you reflect a lot on it, right? And uh, I remember saying, you will? He said, yeah. So I remember walking down that street in Jersey City right before, and I have all these cats outside, and I tell them all, like, yo, you could have here, you guys could have everything. They're like, they thought I was crazy. I'm like, I'm about to go get help, because I was a veteran, I wanted to put myself in the VA hospital. Because I'm like, okay, I'll just go to the VA. I said, like, I, I have a problem. Remember, all this manipulation, I'm like, yo, I have a problem. I, I didn't really want to, I just want, I guess I wanted to get out, I didn't know how to get out, so I tell them, look, I need help. So they go, okay, so I get put in the VA, I remember I'm about to graduate. It's about two weeks. I pick up the phone and I call my dad. And uh, I'm so excited. I go, Dad, guess what? I look good. You know, my weight's up. I said, you know, I I'm about to get out. You know, so I'm moving with you, right? You're going to pick me up? And he's like, yeah. He's like, that's, that's not what we're going to He's like, we can't do that. He goes, I have a girlfriend and she's living with me. And so I remember all this feeling of like, anger and like what and he's like yeah but you want the job and so i'm like no nah, I'm, I'm good he's like are you sure and so that's the first time i ever like took everything i had and suppressed it somewhere far down in the basement you know i just i just didn't want i just pretended like everything was okay i told him i'm good but i remember this inner voice that said i'll show you and so right there and then i wind up talking to some girl that's in this program, I convince her to leave with me because misery loves company and I wind up leaving. And uh, if I got high at this level, I'm gonna go to this level. And whatever I did, I'm gonna do it because really I, at that moment, I, I, I just wanted to show him, you know, I'm gonna show you. Rather than it becoming something good, it was crazy. Somehow, you know, it, the, the story continues. Now, you know, I have, that kid, oh, I wind up getting the same girl pregnant while I'm in the military. And so uh, I don't, I never, I don't meet him till he's 19. In my 20s, when all that's happening and I'm tripping, I wind up going to Virginia because then I guess my second thing was like, oh, I'm going to go to Virginia and I'm going to get away from that. But when I got to Virginia, I took a bunch of drugs with me. I winded up meeting, you know, other people that drugs from the last trip 
when I was there in the military. And uh, now I'm tripping out there and now I meet a girl. And this lady, uh, I wind up, you know, just following the footsteps, I guess, of everything I know that a man does, right? And so a man has to have money, a man has to have women. So I wind up uh, meeting a girl and, and she winds up being the mother of my daughter. So I, you know, wind up going to Puerto Rico because I go, man, maybe this time I'll change, you know, like, I, I just didn't know how to do it. And so I, I wind up going to Puerto Rico because, um, you know, we're going to have this baby and, uh, and, uh, and at this know, point, this is your th essentially third child, third child. Wow. I get out there, you know, I'm thinking we're going to do good. I start selling drugs in Puerto Rico, I, but I wind up Joren Torre, you know, I wind up in the projects in Puerto Rico. So I'm now I'm meeting like some killers and stuff, you know, these cats, they, uh, <laughs> the projects over there, like it ain't like a cop car could come by and they don't really care. You know, when when the people are gonna get invaded in Puerto Rico, it's a national guard, so you see a tank coming through the front gate. And so, uh, interesting enough, man, that's kind of the life I start living over there. I start a little bit of the lady next door. She's doing brujeria, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's just crazy stuff is happening, and so. You know, hey, we're going to leave Puerto Rico now because, you know, no matter where I went, there I was, right? So now we're in Puerto Rico. We're going to leave Puerto Rico because we're going to give my daughter a life. And so we wind up going to Ocala, Florida. Well, I tried going to Jersey for a little bit, but, you know, that was chaotic. And I went back uh, to Ocala, Florida. And when I'm in Ocala, Florida, I wind up meeting, you know, again. So, I always tell people, no matter where you go, there you are. So I wind up going there. You know, it's horse country. There's no way I could get in trouble. It's just impossible, right? Uh, there's no more after hours, you know, in New York. You know, I, I was dealing with the mob, just all kinds of stuff. The stuff that people like seeing movies uh, is kind of what I'm dealing with. So in Ocala, that's impossible, right? There's no way. It's horse country. There's nobody there. But I, just, I asked somebody, hey, you guys got projects around here? And somebody points to the projects. So I go, it's a little country, but there's some projects there. I see the brothers playing basketball, a couple of Hispanic guys out there. I start playing basketball with them. I ask them the, the key question because I didn't think that marijuana would lead me back to everything I was doing. So I had a little good two week run. And so I smoke some pot and then I kick on. So I, before you know it, I'm selling drugs. I try to not get too much involved. So I wind up going to a restaurant. Uh, at that time, that restaurant is uh, basically owned by a mob guy which is crazy is owned by a mob guy who's into santeria too so he's got all the coyales on his neck you know he got all the stuff and so this guy's gonna take me under his wing he's gonna i i don't know it immediately but as we start conversing he so he literally i go to school with this guy and he makes me his sous chef so now i'm a sous chef of a restaurant which is crazy he teaches me all this stuff about cooking takes me under his wing through conversation before you know it i'm leaving with 32 ounce cups of cocaine so, you know, we got all the cocaine in the cup. We got the straw going in it. There's no soda in it. And so every day I'm leaving with a 32-ounce cup, sometimes two and three thirty, uh, 32 32-ounce cups. So at one point, you know, the trust has built up, all the stuff, and I wind up, again, chaotic. You know, I wind up doing the guy dirty. You know how that goes. Uh, before you know it, I'm hooked. I'm jacked up. I'm doing cocaine. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, I wind up uh, moving to another place in Florida, to try to give my daughter a good life, you know, I wind up trying to put the blame on something. So I uh, decide that I'm gonna go to the VA hospital again. I'm gonna go to the VA hospital again. You know, I convince my daughter's mother that I'm gonna go to the VA hospital. And when I get to the VA hospital, I start letting it, I start letting them have it. It's y'all's fault. You know, I'm crazy because of y'all, you know, so they're bringing all kinds of uh, uh, people to like hold me down and stuff because I just started losing my mind. Like, I was like, I'm crazy. You know, I'm crazy because of y'all. I don't like authority because of y'all. I'm getting high. I took every bit of anger, every bit, and I just blamed it at the, at the United States military made me crazy. And it was their fault. So now they're sedating me with stuff. You know, they're giving me, you know, I'm exaggerating, but a hundred bottles of pill, you know, pills. And, you know, I, I have all this stuff. I'm smoking again when I get out and uh you know I just want to change but but it, it just it just wouldn't happen you know so obviously um, my my daughter's mom she smokes pot too so she's thinking it's cool and so for me I'm smoking pot again and so I remember being on the phone with my mom and my mom always knew what I had in me you know as crazy as that sounds she would be like you know 
done it. You, you, ha you're good. You're a good person. And you gotta think, bro. Like, I'm, I'm kicking door, apartment doors, pistol whipping people. You, you know, eleven gun incidents. Just things that, in my mind, I'm like, this woman is crazy. And you know, the whole time I'm thinking, I'm okay with God. I know how to say the Our Father. I know how to do the Hail Mary. There's no way in the planet that you could have told me that I was serving the devil. This whole entire time, I think I'm good with God. This is just what people do. This is just the hands I would dealt. So I'm on the phone with my mom and I go, mom, they told me I have massive depression. You know, that I'm never going to get out of that, you know. And uh, my mom, like, rebuked me. It's funny because she didn't even know, you know, she's not even, it wasn't even connected like that to Jesus. And she's like, you're not. She said, I gave birth to you and you're happy. She goes, you're happy. You're a happy person. She goes, don't, don't you ever. She goes, I know you. I gave birth to you. She goes, if you want to be old, how many, you all those bottle pills, double that, triple that. That's what you're going to be doing when you're an old person. She said, you take all those pills right now. This is my mom. She's like, take all those pills. She, I go, mom, I'm, I'm debating with my mom. And I'm like, the doctor said I have massive depression. You're not a doctor. I remember telling my mom, you're not a doctor. The doctor said this. She said, I don't care what the doctor said. I gave birth to you. I know who you are. Take the pills, throw them in the garbage. So I took all the pills and threw them in the garbage. I've never been depressed again. But I kept smoking because I figured, well, this is what's keeping me good. And at that point, how old were you when, when you did that? Man, everything's blurry. At, at that, maybe I'm in the mid 20s somewhere. I'm somewhere around there because I, I don't get incarcerated until I'm 36. Well, the final incarceration. So maybe right before I get incarcerated, I start getting incarcerated. I'm selling all these drugs. I wind up coming out. I leave, you know, I start selling crack where I'm at. You know, I would, I would fake jobs before you know it. At that point, I started getting incarcerated. So I get incarcerated. You know, I manipulate my way out of there. I get incarcerated again. I get incarcerated again. It's just a vicious, vicious cycle after that. I'm part of the system and I just keep getting incarcerated. Um, and, and, Juan, what's, what's happening right now, even as, as all of this is happening, all of the cycles of incarceration and drugs, yeah. what's happening with your children, with your family around you? Man, you know what? I, um, I, I really didn't know. I started writing my daughter, I think, first. And, um, you know, I would write her letters. And, uh, but we didn't really have a relationship. So it... it it was really even hard to like be a father, right? Cause how, how do I father if I don't, I've never been fathered. So like, how do I father if I don't know father? So I'm just reproducing what I know. And my f father was like Jay-Z, Biggie, Tupac, you know, all of these street guys uh, basically parented me. So that's all I know. I I'm trying to reach them through letters and stuff, but I I'm just hearing stories. The only person that's always really written to me is my mom. Mom never wanted to see me in prison, so even though I've done 10 years of prison in my life, uh she's never seen me in uh oh. in, you know in behind bars and uh my dad he just never visited me, you know, prison. You know, he used to go once a month when I was growing up and stuff. You know, we'd hang out, but I wind up one day thinking about this and I say, you know what, I got tired, you know, I'm making money, I'm in the clubs, you know, it's, it's the thing, the red rope's always removed from me, you know, I'm, I, I'm always getting special treatment, some weird way I always, I always somehow, I guess, favor, you know, I would meet all the club owners, so I, I had a, a name out there and one day I, I make this decision, it's a random decision and I say, you know what, I'm gonna be the man. And so I say, I'm going to take over the world. And so I tell my mom about it, and she thinks I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. She's like, what? I said, Mom, I'm just going to go. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Texas. She's like, you're going to Texas? I said, yeah, I'm going to go to Texas. I'm going to meet somebody over there. They're going to be like the biggest drug dealer. Now, you got to think, because there was a season where everything was going through Florida and Miami, and my stepbrother and all of them, they, I mean, they've came out on the paper. So it's not new news. You know, most of them busted from like really big things, you know, uh, FBI, you know, kicking my family out of the city, literally. And so uh, even though my mom was never drank and never did drugs and I, you know, it was always who she was associated with, right? Who she partnered with. And so later in life, you know, I'm like, yo, I'm going to go do all this stuff. And my mom thinks I'm crazy. She's like, you don't know nobody in Texas. I'm like, I'm going to be fine. So I, I sell some drugs. I get some money. I pack a backpack full of drugs because I knew that no matter where I went, I could sell drugs. All I had to do was find a bar. So I wind up in McAllen, Texas. Uh, McAllen, Texas, Donna, 
uh, Texas. And uh, while I'm there, you know, I get off the bus. I don't know nobody. You know, I'm looking around. You know, I, I think I, I roll up a blunt because in New York, you could just roll and you know, smoke in the street. And so I'm going to smoke. And some girl says to me, yeah, you can't do that out here. And so I'm like, what? And so she's like, yeah. And so the enemy had a plan for me. Right. And so it was right there. And she's like, we're going to Mexico. And so I thought, great. I'm about to meet my big connect. So I hang out with these two girls. They live in Donna, Texas. I go into Mexico. I didn't need a passport or nothing. All I needed was an ID. So I wound up going into Mexico. Before you know it, I, I think at this time, I wound up meeting a guy that was like number nine in the cartel of marijuana trade. And so he ran most of Donna and all that. And so here we go again. I'm hanging out with this girl. She's smoking. We're partying. Before you know it, you know, I came out here because, you know, kilos back then were like 36 in those economic times and over here there were like nine and I just letting you know so you know why I came and so I wind up coming out there and uh, man it becomes this one big party because I'm getting cocaine at the cheapest cost that I've ever got it so I, I, I just I just start doing drugs I love to party I love to party and so I, I wind up doing all the drugs I get locked up on this random stop and I have a blue horn in Jersey and so I'm gonna I'm gonna now go back to, you know, I'm getting incarcerated, I'm upset. Um, I get on this bus and I'm the lowest guy on the totem pole. Everybody there are like Con Air, you ever seen the movie Con Air? So everybody's on the bus, they got, you know, millions and millions of dollars, all these guys are big, big drug dealers, murderers, you know, all kinds of stuff, and me, with a little state jail, uh, state uh, bid, but they got me on the same bus. And so I get on the bus and I get next to this guy and he's from Ohio, and so we're cuffed into each other. We're cuffed, uh, you know, like this, around our waist, next to each other. And uh, at this point, I, you know, I would have thoughts of my kids and I would have thoughts of my family, but the grip was too big. You know, I I loved the lifestyle. I loved the drugs. And I, again, I didn't really, I don't think I understood what it was like to love my kids or even just love somebody. You know, I, I didn't know how to do that. Like, I, I just knew how to do the streets, you know? And so uh, the lifestyle, everything was just so euphoric. And so I'm, I'm incarcerated next to this guy and we're on this bus. And, you know, when that happens and you're getting extradited like that, it's just like the movies. They're not going to tell you when you're stopping. So this took like 18 days to get me from Texas to, you know, just getting out of Texas was like four or five days, you know, six days. I don't remember. It was a lot of days. And so I meet this guy and we don't have a pencil. We don't have a pen. We don't have paper. You don't have none of that because, you know, they just never know who's going to try to get you. These guys have, you know, big charges. And so he starts telling me about this place called Breckenridge, Texas. I'm like, Breckenridge, Texas? And so he's like, yeah. He's like, if you want to make a lot of money, he's like, you're gonna, you need to go there. So he gives me an address. I still remember it because for 18 days, I said this address to myself. That's how di <laughs> diabolical that is, though, that I said that to myself. I would get to, because they stop you in different cities and different states, and I would say to myself all day on the bus, all day until I laid down on the hard floor because you would lay down 24 hours, sometimes 48, sometimes 72 hours. And I would lay there and I would say that address to myself and I would um, fall asleep, wake up. And so I have this Fidel Castro beard. I finally get to Jersey. Remember, none of this stuff, when I say 11 gun incidents and all that, none of the stuff stopped me. I've been like fully bloodied faces, pistol whipped and all kinds of, you know, I think at 15, you know, I had first time that I had a gun in my mouth, you know? So like all of these things never really stopped me to this point. I am still thinking of taking over the planet. It's, it's crazy. You know, I get to Jersey. I, I scream, somebody give me a pencil. And so they give me a pencil and I finally get the address out. I start writing to this address. I don't know Breckenridge, Texas is a small little town in Texas. I never even heard of a small little town. And as crazy as that sounds, right? Because we only live vicariously to television. So I know everybody in Miami got skates, right? That's what you think when I'm growing up in New York. I'm thinking everybody got skates and I think little small country town. I don't know. It's the country and everybody's driving. I thought everybody in Texas had horses and cowboy hats with cowboy boots. I really did. I wind up getting out and... Uh, I'm gonna make this dope deal because now I know the Florida guy, I know this guy, I know this guy, and I know the guy in Texas, and I'm gonna wind up going back to McAllen, Texas, back to Donna, Texas. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make this deal. I'm gonna make like 20, 25,000 in one shot. And so when I get out, I wind up in Breckenridge, Texas. And if I was to say, if I was to like give you a picture, 
bow, 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 with the hound dog on the side, you know? It's this crazy picture, and I'm like, what is going on here? You know, I'm the city slicker. I don't know nothing. I wind up going with this girl, and uh, before you know it, she introduces me to methamphetamines. And so she's, you know, I'm like, you got cocaine, marijuana, you know, I'm looking for all the drugs that I know. She's like, no, we got this. It's the same thing. And so I remember telling, smoking this thing and taking hits of meth and, you know, it's in a light bulb. And I'm thinking, I just ain't doing nothing. But it's like three days later. I was supposed to be in my drop, you know, this, this meet up to make this 25000 I'm supposed to meet on this day. Well, I'm a day late. So that's gone. So I'm not going to, you know, in those... In those things, you're not a day late. You know, you're a day late, everybody starts wigging out and they think you're the cops. You know, so I missed that opportunity. So now I'm in Breckenridge, Texas. The money that I had for my startup has basically ran out. I have no family. I have no friends. And I'm in Breckenridge, Texas. I don't know what to do. And so she's like, man, you know, let's go over here. But, you know, the drug dealer and me and trying to figure stuff out. That's why I always tell people, you could drop me in the middle of Africa. I'm making it home, you know. That's just kind of my life, you know. And so I, uh, I wind up going and uh you know by the grace of god now i know that but i wind up going to this other house and i see a girl sitting there and for the first time in my life now I remember in new york i used to kick people out of the hallway because they you know sell them heroin and they're shooting up in the hallway that would that would get me upset i'd be like what are you doing so now i'm years later i'm in i'm in texas i'm desperate i don't know what to do there's the two country drug about three country one guy's Aryan Brotherhood and the t- uh, two guys a country and they're sitting there and the girl sitting down and she shoots up meth and I see her eyes roll back to her head and I see her have the moment of her life and so I go I want that and so they're like what I'm like yeah but I, I don't want to I don't want to do this I, I want to I want to hold you know I'm going to hold my arm and you, somebody do it for me I just felt weird about shooting up you know they're like are you sure I go yes and so they do it what happens is that turned me into a monster before you know it, you know, fast forward, the guy, the Aryan, I get real close with the Aryan Brotherhood, which was crazy because I'm Puerto Rican from up north and they don't, we don't like each other, but we had a common denominator and that was money and drugs. At that point, he gets incarcerated, but I already know the Mexican guy. This is where I start venturing out to Fort Worth and all that, and I already know the Mexican guy. So Mexican guy, we get to talk in Spanish. They can't talk in Spanish. So before you know it, I make the move, and I wind up in Mineral Wells getting a house there. All my neighbors, because I had the cooking experience, all my neighbors, I had them believing that I was, you know, hey, uh, I'm a chef, and so I'm cooking food, bringing them food while being the main meth distributor on that block of full of houses, and nobody knew this. At this point, I'm moving into... You know, I I, I always share the story how I would like, you know, I would go after the guy and if I can get him high and I can destroy the... Now, I I know this now, but looking then, my my plan was I take the guy out and then he goes to work. He gives me his car. I'm in his home. I have his wife, everything. Like I'm just destroying home by home. I wind up getting another place in Mesquite, Dallas. So now I have a place in Mesquite, Dallas. I have a place in uh mineral wells you know um so i'm i become the main myth dis- meth distributor from mesquite all the way through odessa through abilene and every small town cisco albany all those towns my life is chaos not only now do i have tons of drugs everybody knows me as new york jay and uh, i'm distributing methamphetamines everywhere i'm paying everybody off i'm just living a life of total chaos I just thought it was just a life, way of life. You know, I have uh, selling all this meth. I'm destroying homes. I'm seeing all this happening. I'm selling to now all the truckers. You know, so I'm selling to one trucker, selling to all the truckers and motorcycle gangs, you know. So I'm in the movie Breaking Bad, basically, you know. Life's chaotic. And every now and then when I would trip out, I remember calling I remember calling my mom a couple times or my dad and telling him, like, I think I'm going to die. I think I'm going to die because people were look, like after me because I've... After a while, I'm the only guy that's not from there, and everybody else is from there. So I become the the, the killing point, I guess. And to fast forward, man, I, I I get to this moment. You know, we're getting closer to God trying to talk to me. I've been in a couple of uh, incidents, but before the incident, this is the first thing that happens to me. One morning, I'm going to go sell drugs as usual. And, you know, I would do a lot of stopping. I had different houses and different safe houses because I would put drugs and then make sure that I would stop there to deliver here and do that. And so I get in the car and this is, I could probably count on these hands from the 20s to the age of 36, 
10 fingers, and I can count on these hands how many times I was sober. So I've been up, I don't know, 10 days, 14 days, you know, just incredible amount of days. You know, I don't think me and my wife has ever went into these kind of details. You know, I'm carrying guns with me. I am, uh, I'm a loose cannon. But this day, I was sober. So I'm sober. I got a driver. I'm in the car. And, uh, you know, I remember kicking back like this. And I'm just kind of looking up. And this is my first time ever in my life that I am, um, that I'm sitting there and I, and I, well, I'm looking at the clouds and I kind of feel like I hear a voice. You know what? I, I don't know what Jesus sounds like. I never read my Bible. I just remember looking at the clouds and I, I remember the clouds kind of speaking to me. And I know that it's going to sound super trippy, but I'm in the thing, you know, the girl's talking to me, but you ever seen the movies where it's like everything slow motion? And so I'm crying, like if I got baptized by the Holy Ghost, I'm crying like that, hysterically. And she's like, we're gonna get arrested. What are you, what's wrong with you, you know? And I hear this voice, everything kind of muffles out. And, it, and he says, why are you killing, stealing, and destroying the very lives I'm giving people? And I had never read John 10, 10. I never read the verse. I just heard that voice. And when I heard that voice, it was like, I, I just crying. I was hysterically cl crying, but it was like the faucet being turned off. And so, boom, I stopped crying and I get normal like this. And so then she's like, are you all right? And so I'm like, yeah, I I'm all right. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just wigging out at that moment. And I'm like, I'm fine. She's like, man, you know, you're wigging out. And I don't tell her it's God or anything. I just kind of go like, I'm just like, tripping i go and i deliver the drugs the difference is that now i'm delivering the drugs and i feel i guess uh, a remorse i feel like i'm looking at a lady because i had all these big drug dealers that i was giving it to and sometimes in the house would be like maybe a mom or maybe like somebody and i just you know i knew that was destroying teachers lives and dentists and i, I had dentists i was serving i uh go and i I handle the drugs, but I feel this conviction. But I don't listen because I don't know how to stop. But I wind up telling people in that town when I will go and I'm delivering, I said, man, you know what? I didn't tell the girl in the car, but now the girl hears this because she's coming with me. And I tell them, hey, you know, I, I feel like God speaking to me. And everybody would laugh. And everybody in the room thought I was crazy. And they would tell me, like, are you high? You saying that because you high, bro. Like, God ain't talking to you. And so time goes on and I don't listen. I keep delivering the drugs. Obviously, I've been incarcerated a couple times, even in Texas, state prison, TDCJ. And at this point, I'm going to get incarcerated again. But I don't get incarcerated yet. What winds up happening, I get a, a short incarceration, a short stint. I get out. I don't listen still. And when I get out, I got to get back on my feet. So I start. The guy who's selling to me in the town, I wind up surpassing him and needing more than what he could provide. And they didn't like it. They wind up setting me up, you know, one of the lead blood guys out there. And uh, I wind up in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm going to pick up drugs. It's a setup. They beat me for about, I'm going to say it felt like three hours, but I'm going to say it's probably like 30 minutes. My head is out to here. I'm f full of blood. I'm laying on the ground because I kept trying to pick up my head because they kept saying they had a gun in the head of the girl. I make the handoff, I turn around, I taste the drugs. I go, yo, this ain't real. I grab the guy by his legs, he falls. I go to hit him, the guy comes out from the from the woods and he's like, yo, the, you know, basically drop your arm. And so when I drop my arm and turn around, they start beating me, beating me, beating me. I remember hearing the clack of the gun. And, and I tell people this all the time. I feel like that's the moment I got saved. And I know, you know, I sound like, because it was the first time that I guess I've been in all these gun incidents, but this is the first time that I heard the and I said, oh, he's about to shoot me. And so I knew enough that I didn't know how God speaks. I didn't know. I just knew that at that moment, like I, I was, I don't know if there's a heaven and a hell. I got to make sure that I'm good and I don't know how to repent and I don't know how to talk to God normal. So I start yelling, our father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And when I look up, they're in the car and they took off. They, they took everything and the, the guy never pulls the trigger. 
but the clack went. So he must have cocked it back. I didn't hear the cock. I just know he leaves. And so when I get up, the girl gets up and she looks at me and she loses it. Ah! And I look down and I guess I'm drenched in blood from the top of my head all the way going down. You know, and I, you know, I, I'm just like, we're going to help too, but not as much as see because I can't see myself. I walk by, I start going to these, hey, I need help. And so people... You know, your baggy jeans, my phone winded up being down here, even though they stole everything, the baggy jeans hit the phone. And so I pulled out my phone, 911 comes, they're trying to tell me it's a dope deal, I say it's not. I tell them I got jumped, they know I'm lying, but they can't prove it. And so nobody opened the door for me, the hotel actually locked the door. I winded up seeing my face and all that. I wound up going to the hospital and calling another drug dealer to actually bring me drugs. The insanity of that is that it, I didn't stop then either. Because I always thought I was invincible. And what it did was it caused this this attitude of this pride to rise up and say, you know what, you mess with the wrong guy. So I wind up going to that dude's house. He's sitting there with a shotgun. I go into the kitchen because it's shotgun. I go, what's wrong? And I know he did it and he knows he did it, but I can't prove it. And he, so we're both trying to talk to each other in a way like nothing happened. All I'm trying to do is get more drugs from the guy. I could care less if he set me up. I'm gonna get him later. This guy, I mean, I'm thinking now he must have raised grandma or somebody that knew the Lord because he says to me, we're, you know, he's like, man, I'm going to give you this to start. And so I'm back to square one, you know, and I'm like, it's cool, you know, because I'm I'm going I'm, I'm to come up. And so he gives me about an eight ball of dope methamphetamine and he uh, he winds up uh, telling me, I said, man, I said, you know, I tell him, I thought I was going to die. And he's like, you know, you're going to hell, right? A drug dealer tells me this and not even a, a believer. Uh, Christian, you know, he says, hey, you know, you're going to hell. And I go, I ain't going to hell, bro. I say that our father is what I tell him. I say, I ain't going to hell. I, say, I, I know that our father, I could do the Hail Mary, look, Hail Mary full of grace, you know. And uh, he's, he looks at me, he's like, nah, bro, you sell drugs, bro. You're going to hell. Like you, you actually, now he, look, check, check out the, the thing here. He goes, you actually mess up lives. Remember what the Lord said to me in the car? So I'm like, so it's the first time, you know, all these little things are connecting and I walk away and I go like, going to hell. I ain't going to hell. This is crazy. Hell's for bad people. Weird, right? Because I don't think I'm a bad person, even though I do all that stuff. Because all my family did it. All these people around me did it. The TV did it. Everybody, everybody did it, right? As long as you go to church on Sunday, you can just do whatever you want. That was my mentality. So I never really saw myself as a bad person. This guy's now telling me I'm going to hell. Then I had that one moment, you know, and uh, before you know it, you know, I get set up. I tell people it was the weirdest thing ever. You know, I, I'm going to go to a safe house. I'm coming back. I had just, I was one step away from picking up the big load. And, and uh, God's grace, he didn't, he let me do it. I'm uh, pulling up to the safe house in Weatherford. And you know, you got cars on the side of the road that say for sale and all that. Okay. The car, everything that was around there, feds were in it. You know, all these people were in it. <laughs> there were all cops in there. You know, the hot dog cart guy had a badge. You know, everybody was like, I get to the thing. They kick down the door. They go, all right, get on the ground, get on the ground. And so I get on the ground. You know, all the guns are pointed at me and they, uh, they don't tell me nothing about drugs. They go, you're under arrest, aggravated assault. You're gonna be doing a long time. And so I'm like, I got ready to assault. I said, I didn't assault nobody. And so uh they wind up finding under 250 grams of methamphetamines and uh they're gonna stick me with a charge. And they wanna give me 25 years. They're like, you're gonna get 25 years for aggravated robbery. I say, aggravated robbery? They say, Yeah, you assaulted this guy. Some guy had set up this other guy, and the when the cops came, the girl, the guy told the girl which is, uh, it's a whole story there. That guy's even wrote me a letter in the, you know, in the future, he wrote me a letter and uh, he was in prison apologizing. So that even is a wild story. But she says, it was New York J. So they went looking for me. She told the guy, the guy's all beat up. I go, what'd they take? I said, man, $100 credit card. I was like, man, I got like 52 of those. I don't need that. So we're arguing back and forth, me and the detectives, they're behind the, the glass. And so they're gonna give me this lie detector test. And he says, Okay, you want me to help you, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay. So you were there that night. You were high. You got angry. You hit the guy. I was like, that's not true. So I jump up and I go, I'm a drug dealer. I don't, I don't, I confess to everything. I'm a drug dealer. I don't do any of this stuff. I don't, I don't, and he said, I pay people. I got the pride, right? I get up, I go, I pay people to, to smash people. I don't do that on my own. Why would I go knock on this door and hit him in the, 
all the guys from Breckenridge, Ridge, all the detectives come out. And, and so I even tell them, tell them who I am. You know who I am. I was okay with having that identity. That, that, that identity made me feel like I was somebody. The proper identity of who I was supposed to be, like, that never occurred to me. Like, it was, I was proud of who I was. I was a drug dealer. I was a thug. I was proud of that. Everybody around me glorified me and made me feel like, like that's a good thing to be. You're cool or you're whatever, whatever the thought was. And so I wound up getting incarcerated. I'm facing 25 years and uh, it's the first time that I couldn't buy myself out. I had the money, girl comes up, she's looking at me on the other side of the glass and she's like, judge said no bond. And I remember losing it. No bond, Boom, I hit the window, I'm cussing. So she leaves. Takes the money, I guess. She, no, she winds up putting some of that money in my books, all that. And so I'm in this pod and I look down and there's a Fate to Fate by Kenneth Copeland. The moment in the car, the drug dealer, you know, all these little pieces. And then a Fate to Fate. I start reading the Fate to Fate. Nothing changed right away. You know, I start reading the Fate to Fate. I start thinking, it's speaking to me. I'm like, man, it doesn't happen in that cell. You know, I, I just, I'm yelling at guys because I still want to watch rap and I'm trying to fight these guys because they want to change the TV. I wind up one day going to my cell because I'm facing the 25 years. Literally, I know God was going to drop it to four years. So I wound up getting a four-year sentence this last bid. I, I, I fall on my knees and I, 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 just, I just don't want to live like that no more. The interesting part is that I meet a guy there and he tells me he's a pastor. And I don't know what a pastor is. So I'm like... All I know is a priest, you know, collar, bald head, you know, Latino, you know, smoking cigarettes or whatever. But he's like, yeah, I'm here for you. And so I start laughing. I go, you ain't here for me, bro. You, you got in trouble and you're here. And so the next day, you know, he goes to a cell. You know, my wife thinks he's an angel. My wife's like, you met an angel? Because I, I have pretty much a memory like an elephant. I don't remember this guy's name. I go to my cell. I look up the next day. and He's uh, in a cell. and He's prostrated on the ground, kind of like, you know, with his blanket. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna ask this guy some questions. But he don't get up. So I go work out, he didn't get up. I go eat, he didn't get up. You know, we're talking an hour later, man. And I'm like, what the heck? So I, I go, all right. So I'm eating a soup and he gets up. And so I yell at him, yo! Cause there's a, there's, there's this, uh, you know, kind of looks like this, you know, like one big O and there's a gate in the middle. And so we would meet at that gate. And so I go, hey, meet me at the gate. So I go meet him at the gate. I go, man, what were you doing? He's like, I was praying for you. He goes, I'm only here for you. And so I... He goes, I'm only here for you. And I uh, I was like, what does that even mean? You know, he, I said, you were... <laughs> he, I go, he goes, I was praying. I go, you said that many our fathers? Because I, th you know, I, th I thought he was just our father and I didn't know you could actually talk to God. And so this guy's like, I'm here for you. He's like, you ever read the Bible? He starts telling me stuff. He says, look, I'm here. I said, man, you're, so you're not guilty. He goes, no, I'm going to leave soon. He goes, I, I'm, I'm, I was married and my wife's addicted to drugs. I'm a pastor. And so she came, started arguing with me in the car. Neighbors called the cops. She threw the pipe under my car. You know, she smokes crack. She goes, I'm, he goes, I'm here, but I, I'm here for you. I'm, it's the only reason I could be here. So he's like, you need to go read your Bible. So I go in my cell, man, and I, I start reading the Bible, you know. And uh, I think I was like, I read Proverbs that night. I don't think I slept. I read Proverbs. I started going through Psalms, Matthew. And I felt like, you ever seen Beetlejuice where, where the hand comes out the soup and pulls them in? Okay, that's how I felt. That's what I felt happened to me. I was pulled in. I, it's like things started clicking. And I was like, oh my God, I was so excited. I was just reading, reading, reading. And I got to my knees and I just started like thanking God, you know, and I, I think it's the first time I ever really talked to him, you know, and I'm like, God, I'm so sorry for, for the man I am. And I didn't know how to repent. So I just started, <laughs> I just started listing all my sins, you know, I'm like, for being a cheater and adultery, for not being a dad, for being a drug addict, for being greedy for money. Like I just started just, I don't know. It was just me and the Lord. And the next morning comes up about four in the morning, you know, I run out, go, Hey, you know, he's already watching, I think TBN and all that. Cause that's what he got me to watching after a while. So he, I go, Hey, he comes up. We start talking at the gate. He said, what happened? I said, I, I, I read the Bible. I go, man, this is so good. He goes, what'd you get out of it? I said, God, he said, no, no, no. What'd you get out of it? I said, God, he starts talking to me about how to read the Bible. 
And then he tells me, like, he said, you know, it's like your first Snickers from commissary. He said, you take a bite. And then he said, you know how you taste every layer? He said, when you're out in the free world and you eat a Snickers, you just eat it. He said, but when you're incarcerated, you take a bite. And you could taste the caramel, the chocolate. He goes, that's how I want you to read the Bible. <laughs> he goes, when you read something, I want you to just chew on it. And so uh, I started doing that. We started walking it out. Fast forward, before you know it, he... Uh, I go looking for him because I wind up getting into the trustee camp. I always had favor and I become like the main cook there because of the chef thing. You know, every one of those things did something for me that the enemy used for destroy to destroy me. Every one of those things, God had a plan with it. And so there I am and I come out. I told the guard, hey, I want to bring him sandwiches before you know it. The guy's gone. I go, he's not here? They go, yeah, he was innocent. They, they let him go home. So that rocked me. I wind up going down before you know it. I'm doing my time. I'm, I'm praying with people. I'm evangelizing. I'm doing everything the Bible says. And I just believed what it said. You know, I was like, this is what it says. I'm just going to go do it. And I had the zeal. And I, I'm out there and I'm doing all this stuff. And amazing to say, I wind up getting moved to a pre release facility and I'm sitting in a bunk. This kid walks in. Now, as you remember, I told you that I had a son named Jonathan and then uh, Jay and Nina and I, I didn't, I never seen Jonathan. I just knew Jonathan was out there. And he walks in and he's about the age, you know, he's 19. And he walks in and I go, hey, what's up? I'm fired up for the Lord now, right? So I'm sitting on my bunk and he's like, I go, so what's your name? He goes, Jonathan. And so inwardly I thought, oh, my son. So I'm a father of this guy. So I start fathering this guy. I started discipling this guy. We started walking the yard together. We started doing all these things. Later, I would marry his mom, which is my baby Ruth. And so, um, even that got turned into a story, you know? It's like the best thing that happened, well, besides Jesus, you know? Uh, just meeting my wife and, and we started writing and, uh, you know, we started writing when I was in prison and uh, I get out. I, want, I don't wind up coming to her. I wind up going somewhere else. And uh, she's like, ah, you know, I don't know if I could wait, you know? And I'm like, oh, it, was, it didn't matter. I was gonna walk this out. And even though I wanted her to wait, we get together and little by little, I start telling her things. And she's like, why don't you go back to those places? Cause I was told I wanted to go back to you. Before you know it, we're, we're, we're hitting, I don't know how to do nothing. I'm just doing it. I'm just going back. I wanted to bring light, you know, to these places. And uh, before you know it, God restores, brings all my kids, uh, to Texas, little by little, me and my wife were getting on planes and picking them up, and they're coming over, and now they all live here, and now we have two Jonathans, and uh, you know we 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 got together and uh, we got married, and you know the journey continues. Now we're pastors of a church, and uh, <laughs> it's just it's still a wild journey. You know, it's a wild journey, uh, still real heavy and and helping people out, but. The story still continues. I, I wish I, I had answers. You know, I only have one answer. It's a one-step program, right? And uh, my family is doing great and uh, just got my doctorate a week ago. So uh, kind of interesting how God keeps doing things in our lives that seem impossible. And uh, that's my story. That's my story. Juan, I want to take it back a little bit here. Yeah. Um, first of all, how, how many years did you spend in, in prison? About 10. I spent about 10 years in prison. Uh, my last one was four, then I did like two, two, one, six months, you know? Yeah. Maybe over 10. I say 10 is a good number. Could have been 11, Yeah. but I'd say 10. And uh, um, when you got introduced to this uh, pastor that was in prison as well, yeah. wrongly convicted, you mentioned that you started reading your Bible. He recommended to go and spend time in the Word of God, and yes. He encouraged you to do that. And then you said that you started to do what the Bible says, and I'm just curious, as you begin to do what it says, freshly new Christian, right? Could you tell us a little bit about what you experienced as you begin to do what the Word of God was telling you to do in prison? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of fear. <laughs> In, in a weird way, right? Super nervous, 
knew, right? I remember the first time God was like, okay, I want you to go talk to those guys. And it was a table of nothing but killers. And they, they got tattoos, you know, they got the lip cut. Everything's crazy, right? I mean, I'm fully tatted too, but these would look crazy, crazy. And so uh, allowing him to be the one leading me despite of how I was feeling was uh, a great lesson in that. Not really knowing what it was going to be like. That's why I say fear, like stepping into the unknown of like what it's like to forgive, what it's like. And standing in what you actually believe and i know this this sounds so uh might sound so like well of course i don't i don't think that happens i don't think it happens much i think most people know the bible here but don't live it out and so they don't get to encounter or experience jesus and learn from jesus and i feel like in prison the training ground there was that you know i always tell people like i see people get saved and then it's like you know they say they're saved and you know, you got to beg them to do things. That didn't happen to me. When I encountered Jesus, I wanted to tell people about Jesus. I was just nervous on how to do it. I uh, wanted, we started a, a prayer by the tree. I wanted to do those things. Nobody had to tell me to evangelize. Nobody, now, was it uh, scary? Yes. You know, maybe fear was a very strong word. It was, it, but it crept in. You know, I just had to move on what I believed was was true, not on how I was feeling. And I wanted, you know, it's the born again experience, right? So here I am doing all these things that I've never done before, but I wanted something new. So I kept doing things that kind of went against what I even believed. Hmm. You get what I'm saying? My my prison is so interesting because I started getting known in the prison. Uh, everybody kind of knew me in the prison. We started a faith-based pod. It was the first one starting there and we started it on the third floor. And so from a certain time to a certain time, you know, I would tell guys, yo, you can't smoke here. They were like, man, New York, chill out, man. We locked up. I said, you locked up. I'm in college. I used to tell them, I'm in college, you know. I'm learning, you know. I'm not locked up. And so uh, they would get upset, but I would stand. All the gangs would be like, New York, you don't have to fight. You don't have to, you know, there was a couple scenarios that happened, and they, they would kind of like jump in and be like, hey, we're not there yet, you know, but, but you don't have to. And so I felt like that boldness spoke to people they would come to my room or to my i say my room but you know they would come visit me like nicodemus in the night you know four in the morning have conversations with me i would pray for them so that nobody else saw that what they were doing because it had something in me was attracting them to what i was doing it was just a great experience even though it felt weird because when you're doing those things you know even my uh my uh ruthie's john my jonathan the one i met in there after a while, he was like, man, because I, I, I was being different. And, you know, everybody there was a lot of people still tattooing, a lot of people still doing a bunch of stuff. And so when, you, when you're going to live that out, you start looking different than everybody else. Yeah. And, and I think that's the part where it becomes problematic. But it was exciting. I loved it. Mm. I, I loved it. It, was weird. it sounds weird. People would always tell me like, man, and I still go back and tell these stories. And they're like, you're way too happy, bro. You locked up. I was like, nah, bro. It was this joy of the Lord. You know, I was walking the yard one day and I felt, again, I had a cloud moment. And so when I was looking at the clouds, I felt like the Lord would, I, I used to think that the clouds were the angel's canvas. And I would look at it and see like an arm and say, oh, he wants me to be strong today, you know? And one day I was walking, I was like, man, God, I want to get out. I feel so alone, you know? I'm like, when are we going to get married? When are we going to do this? He's like, Juan, he's like, until you could be happy with me, you're never going to make someone happy. Mm. And so, yeah, I just, I don't know. I enjoyed my single life being incarcerated yeah i started to learn that it doesn't matter where you're at because you know my my encounter with jesus in that incarceration it wasn't just it got to the point where i just wasn't with jesus so he could get me out i was already out <laughs> i was already free i was already happy uh, uh, th those questions meant nothing and then eventually i got out right hmm. Juan, can you talk to me about the uh, one thing that you you mentioned throughout your testimony was your identity, right? Not knowing who you were. Yeah. Um, and so you went into these all of these different areas to try to solidify or, or find, you know, who you are, yeah. define who you are in drugs and in all of these different things. Um, as you begin to build relationship with Jesus, uh, what did that process look like of now identifying as a son of God? How did that come about in, in your life? How did he do that for you? You know, I, it's, it's an interesting question. 
um, because I, I'm always thinking, because I, I just don't want to give you an answer that just sounds like a, a verse that's not lived out. You know what I mean? So I think like for me, the more I started spending time with him, because, you know, I didn't instantly, you know, you hear all these terms like father, deliverer, rescuer. I think for me, the more he revealed himself to me as I kept growing with him, the more he revealed me to me. <laughs> you know, like first I was rescued, right? Because I was incarcerated, drugs, all this stuff. And I just knew he was a rescuer. I just knew he was my deliverer. And as that relationship kept growing, and the more the more I knew the truth, he started to identify some of these lies, right? Because most of my life, I had, that's why I had so many aliases. That's why I was trying, I'll be this to this person, this to that person, you know? Trying to be all these things with a huge void in my life that was destroying my life. The more I got to know him, and the more he revealed himself to me, and the more I kept walking with him, because I see people always focus on all these problems and all this stuff like it's not where I went I just started walking with him and he just kept, year after year even today he's still showing me me and the more I know him I know that I am made in his likeness and his image right like that is the goal not to make a better version of Juan because then I'm gonna be like this version is this this version that's not the goal the goal is to be you're supposed to be looking more like him so that when somebody looks at you they see him and then they scratch their head because they're like, Juan, how are you like that? And I get to say, it's him. So my identity is rooted and grounded in who he is. And the more it's becoming one, right? The more I spend time with him and read my word, uh, they didn't know how to read my word, right? In the beginning, I'm just reading. I'm just cramming stuff. I I put myself out there to try to pray, and maybe it came out wrong, but after 90 times, 100 times, 200 times, right? I remember this guy, uh, when I started reading, I didn't know how to read the King James, but everybody around me was like, if you ain't reading the King James, you, and, and this is important, I think, uh, to the question of identity, because they were like, if you don't read the King James, here we go again, right? They're trying to stamp. If you don't do the King James, you don't have a relationship with God. And I'm over here like, I don't, I barely, I started reading when I was 36. Isn't that interesting? I got a doctorate and I started reading when I was 36. And so like, I knew how to read, but I'm saying I wasn't an avid reader. And so here I am reading the easy to read Bible. And God's giving me revelation that they're like, man, where'd you get that from? Where, where's that text come from? And I was like, well, it's in the easy to read. It's in the easy to read Bible. It's like a kid Bible. But I'm getting all this revelation because God is still speaking to me and his spirit is still true. The guy comes in that was a Christian and then he became a Mormon and he spent enough time with me to see Jesus that by the time I left, he became a Christian again. And I think a lot of times we're even in Christianity, we're looking to all these people trying to be these people rather than being Jesus. I mean, for me, it's just always been a daily walk with him. And the closer I get with him, he always promises to be there with me and he's here with me. And so that's really how I've gained everything. It's, it's, I've always kept it simple. I never had like a system or a pattern to try to like, this is how you do with Jesus. Like spend time with him, talk to him. The Bible's important, not because so you could have all this puffed up head knowledge, but so that you could know Jesus, so that you could know who He is. Hmm. Now, when you when you came out of uh, uh, out of prison, yeah, there's a lot of uh, people that would come out of prison and have a hard time in their relationship with God. Yeah, coming out because now you have all of the other things that you used to struggle with. Now they're an option again. Whereas in, in prison, maybe it was a little bit harder to get involved with those things. So for you specifically, did you have any um, problems with that, with coming out into this new place of like physical freedom, totally. right? And yeah. having all of these options, did you struggle in any way with that? Yes, and uh, it gets easier and it gets better. But here's the problem. So my discernment muscle, uh, like I said, everything I've done here, God turned it around, right? When I got out, I could see people and I knew what kind of drug they were on. I could actually, if they were walking to a hotel, I could beat them to the room and I could tell you what they were going to do tomorrow, like instantly, right? Because 23 years of my life, 36, at 36, I got saved, um, right? So 23 years of my life, 13 to 36, right? I wind up like I can see that. And so at those times, I remember like turning on, I, think, I don't know, I forgot what songs were on, but turning on Kim Walker and kind of like, 
jamming to her music or, you know, Carrie Job, whoever it was. And the fact that, I, and I always tell people this, even though, like, just happened to me not long ago, right? Because because of that, like I could see things, but God has given me a way to fight that. And so, even though when I said I didn't go directly to Ruthie was because I didn't, we weren't married. Ruthie's the first woman in my life that we didn't have sex before we got married, right? So I get to say that one time, and so I'm like, yes. So came out, obviously wanted a woman. Obviously, there was all these things. But I just wanted to please the Lord. And I knew, I already knew what this got me. I never, you know, I, I want to see what this got me. And so all these struggles when I got out, whether it was being with a woman, whether it was getting high again, whether it was, man, I remember crying out, you know, nine months, I had no money. But just something in me was greater than whatever was going on on the outside. You know, you read all these verses, but it's the truth. You know, I wanted to quit, but... I had encountered Jesus, like that was real and tangible to me. And even though I didn't do, know how to do any of it, when, when those things would come and I, I would think about getting high, I remember one day telling my uh, beautiful wife at a Ross, like I remember getting so upset because I didn't even know how to be a Christian husband. I didn't know how to be a, a Christian dad. And I didn't, I didn't know how to do anything. Remember all those things uh, I didn't know how to do. And so every day, I think of stuff. I said, man, you know what? If there was a time I wanted to get high, it'd be right now. And so I would I would stand next to her and I wouldn't leave her side because I knew that if I left, I might probably go get high. Do you get insane? So it's not that I have all those thoughts. I had every thought, every single thought you could think of. Selling drugs again, uh, getting high again, being the man again. All of those things, I'm constantly... Now, they used to happen like every other day. Now they happen like once or twice a year, you know, uh, so it happens less and less because I learned how to be a new person. I've learned how to be a new person, but in the very beginning, yeah, you're gonna have all those struggles. Every time you're gonna think that your idea and your way is the best way to do it, and you have to always go to playing out the tape. I always, you know, in the beginning, I always played out the tape, and if I like the way the movie ends, then I would do it again, but I didn't like the way the movie ended every single time. It was me in prison or me almost dying or me losing my kids and losing everybody. Juan, how's your relationship with your father today? Um, you know what? That is uh, a good question. I, I'm okay with my relationship with my father. I think like today, um, you know, I still call, you know, he calls. So it's still working. It's still a work in progress. Those things would affect me. You know, I would think about it and stuff. And the Lord said to me, Juan, what do you want to see? And, and the things I mentioned were the fruit of the Spirit, you know, like love, kind, you know. He's like, Juan... You can't expect that from people that really don't have that relationship with me. So be patient. And so that's what we're being, right? We have conversations, right? We, we talk about things, but I think my life for itself, when we talk, it makes me feel good that his conversations are like, man, I see all this stuff you're doing. So I know Jesus is speaking to him. Uh, so our relationship, all my relationship has been pretty mended and, and well, you know, we, you know, my soul as well. I have conversations with them. We have conversations. You know, I guess I've learned to be a father by our Heavenly Father. So it taught me how to be a husband, taught me how to be a father. It taught me all these things. And so how I feel about my kiddos, I don't know if my father feels like that about me because I don't think he knows. I don't think he knows. So I don't know if that was a mouthful on relationship. I think it's a good relationship. I just think we're at where he's at. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. And and lastly, just with your children, you know, there was a, a large, a good portion of your life where, you know, you mentioned you were absent or you weren't fully there. Yeah. How's your relationship with your children today? How has the Lord helped you in that today? <laughs> Amazing. Now, look, my daughter's actually sitting here right now and uh, uh, she actually works for the church, you know, helps the church, volunteers in the church. So they all came and got baptized. They're all doing their thing. Uh, my son, too. Let me tell you something. When I got out, I was a lot further in my walk, and my kids were just starting. And there was a lot of hurts. There was a lot of probably disappointments, you know? And so uh, I was telling people, I go, like, it took us like six years to literally have, like, our relationship's phenomenal now. But it was a lot of work of, like, you don't text me. 
this is how I feel. You know, uh, this is how I feel. You know, this, da da da, da and yeah, a lot of that, and not quitting. Not quitting. I think a lot of people opt out because something's not working. You got to understand that I wasn't in their lives for so long. And, and I, I would get so frustrated because I wanted them to be the son that I am to the father, to our Heavenly Father, right? I'm like, I want you to be like that. But they were still learning how to be my daughter. Like, I, they were still learning how to have conversations with me. I mean, shoot. Just imagine, 19 years later, you know, here's your kid. You know, there's so much, you know, first we got to learn how to be a, a father and a daughter accurately and a father and a son. And then once we learn that, which took like six, seven, you know, five, six, seven years, I don't know. I, right now we have a good rhythm. I think we all understand this is a daughter. This is a father. Once we learn that, now it's like, hey, we want to go do this. You know, and to some people, they might not understand that because they weren't me. I'm finally like, I'm finally a father. I finally want to be a dad. You know, I finally get to be a dad. They're probably like, I've, my father's finally here. And so for most people like, oh, let him be, let him do this. Like for me, it's like, no, for some reason, God united us. So our relationship is really good. I feel like we have great conversations, great texting. You know, I think everything's pretty awesome. I think, uh, you know, me and my wife, you know, all our, all our kiddos, they're, they're all uh, working at building that relationship with Christ, right? So that's a good thing. Juan, who is Jesus to you? He's he's everything. And I cried a lot on the show. Golly. Uh, you know, I, I I could say all the things that he has been because he's so much greater than that, right? If I say Jesus is everything, you know, Jesus started as my rescuer and my deliverer. Then Jesus was my father. Jesus you know, obviously Savior, He's my Lord, He's my King. He's, there's all these words. But every single time, like, it didn't just start like, Jesus is my friend, even though we might read the verse and say, Jesus is my friend. As I keep walking with Him, I realize that no greater love than this than one that would give His life, right? So I realize that He's given His life for me. And in every situation, He's there. And He he comforts me as a, as a friend. But, but then He's a loving Father, you know, he's, he has so many facets. So to me, he's everything. And, and I think the rest of my life, I'll still be saying, oh, he's this too. And oh, he's this too. It, it's hard to put that in, in verbiage or in a sentence because he is every single thing I've ever needed that I didn't know I needed. That now I know I need and he keeps becoming that every single day of my life. Mm. Juan, could you give a word of encouragement to people who may be finding themselves in that struggle that you were once were in that cycle of incarceration, drugs, all of these different things, uh, if they're watching right now, or maybe if they even know somebody who is in that cycle, could you just give a word of encouragement to those who are watching? Well, I have to tell you, obviously looking back, I understand totally how you feel. Uh, maybe you feel like there's no way out. Maybe you feel like nobody understands you. Maybe you think you know God, but you keep running into the same trap and the same rut. I'll tell you one thing. He is real. Um, you just have to get around some people that know the truth. You might not think it's the truth, but it is. And so for me, you know, my son, my, some of my sons went through the same thing. And I used to always tell him this. I said, son, at some point, you always follow the man who's on his way back. And so my encouragement to you, you know, you're not gonna, go, you wanna follow, you wanna get to Walmart, you follow somebody that's on his way back from Walmart. And so I've been where you are. I've had needles in my arms, I've been incarcerated. Uh, I've been a horrible dad, I've been all these things. But Jesus has a purpose for you. And I wanna encourage you to seek out the truth and stop believing the lie. And Juan, as, as people have watched your testimony, if they're, at a place where they want a relationship with Jesus and they're ready to give their lives completely to Jesus. Could you just pray for them as, as they're watching right now? Absolutely. I'd be honored to. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have met them exactly where they're at. Lord, I know that 
um, there's this fight going on on should they or should they not. Lord, I pray that you would give them confirmation and give them a hunger and a thirst, a desire in their heart to want to see your goodness, to want to see all that you have for them. And Lord, I know that you will place someone in their life as step one for them to reach out and walk in the way, in the truth, and the life that you have for them. So Lord, I'm grateful that they will have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to them. And Lord, I know it's going to be tough, but I know, Lord, that you could be their strength in their ever-present time of need. Lord, I just ask, I know you've given us all faith, and that little bit of faith can get us to move forward in the area or in the place that you want us to go to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Juan, any last words for the people who are watching on the other side of the screen? Jesus is real. Jesus is real. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.